Greetings and salutations, my rascal pirates. It is I, the Captain Patrick Ferguson, and welcome to another episode of the Captain's Cast. I got something special for you here today, something I never thought I'd be excited. I'm going to use the word excited to talk about. Uh, Children of the Corn. Now, this is one of those titles that has more weight to it than it does a good movie. When you say, oh man, did you see that Stephen King film? You know, Children of the Corn. Dun, dun, dun. It has a good name. Children of the Corn, what is that? You know, then you put in the film and, you know, what, 90 minutes pass, whatever. Credits roll and you go, oh yeah. Huh, okay. And then you move on with your fucking life. Uh, it's not a bad film, but it's not a, a spectacular one. There are plenty of better Stephen King adaptations. And I mean, not to the fault of the original source material. It was a short story. So to expand on that to make a movie, okay. They just chose the easiest route. Um, and it's fine. You know, it has a couple memorable moments, you know. Uh, Malachi, uh, Outlander. Um, certainly, I think the crown jewel, if anyone is going to remember the film, Children of the Corn, not just some obscure title, you're going to remember Isaac. I mean, that's, that is the character that, uh, works probably the most efficiently in that original Children of the Corn. I want to say the actor was... John Franklin, is that correct, who played Isaac? Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's John Franklin. Um, he was a unique actor because he looked a lot younger than uh, what he actually was. I believe he was in his 20s, and he was playing this child role. And I think that helped to have the fury of a man, you know what I mean? But with such an innocent-looking face, um, I thought... Just his performance was so over the top. He was so natural with it that, I mean, yeah, you walk away from Children of the Corn, besides a couple lines, you remember, oh, Isaac. What else happened in that movie? I think uh, a, a stock effect was in the clouds at the end, and that was supposed to be the evil. You know, it's kind of fuzzy. It's like, what happens in that? I don't know. Is it ridiculous? Yeah. It's a little subpar. Yeah. But it gets the idea across of what Children of the Corn is enough, I think. Enough to be like, all right, you know, a little one and done. But then you get the sequels. Now, I've never seen all of them. And uh, even, even today, I have not seen all of them. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the first couple sequels. You know, so maybe I'll do a part one here now, and then when I see the rest of the sequels, I'll do a part two to this, uh, this particular subject. But the sequels get so, so much funner, <laughs> varying degrees of good, but so much funner than that first one, which is just kind of like, eh, you could put it on in the background at a Halloween party. You look up every once in a while, hey, look, it's an Isaac scene, and then you go back, and we're drinking, and we're opening our mini Snickers. T-fucking-E. I've bounced around on the sequels, you know? I've caught one or two on before, watched a few minutes of this one, a few minutes of that. Uh, one of the last ones I ever actually sat through sim seemed like a decade ago. Uh... When there was a brand new Children of the Corn, free on some streaming service, and I said, all right, let's give it a shot. I'm up at 4 a.m. What's sleeping? <laughs> and I clicked play, and I'm pretty sure a movie happened. I don't think it was a good one, but a movie happened, and <laughs> that's all I could tell you. I'm pretty sure when I actually hit that specific one that I'm barely remembering, uh, I'll be talking about it like, oh yeah, that was the one where jack shit happened. Luckily, 
That is not one of the ones that I'm going to talk about now. So, I am going to discuss uh, Children of the Corn 2, 3, and 4. And uh, we'll just do it in chronological order. I don't see any reason to get crazy with it, you know? I'm not some type of fucking unhinged person that would talk about this series and not the chronological order. Though I'm not really reviewing one. So, um, Children of the Corn, the final sacrifice. Now, to say the final sacrifice in your second installment is kind of jumping the gun. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know anything about jumping the gun on a horror series. <laughs> yeah. So, this little flick uh, had a, a decent budget. Had a decent budget. It was about uh, one million. About one million to make a little horror sequel. And uh, especially in the early 90s. 92, to be exact. So, the year I was born, we were having Children of the Corn, The Final Sacrifice. Um... For, yeah, a one million budget for a little 90s slasher sequel is not too bad. And I will say slasher. This needs to be understood if we're going to proceed with the farce uh, any further than this. Um, when you take the original Children of the Corn, people get killed, but I don't know if I'd call it a slasher. You know, I, I, I wouldn't quite put it in that formula. This one kind of is. You know, you have, um, uh, you know, he who hides behind the rose. You do have him more present, uh, or it, the creature, whatever you want to call it. Um, much like in the first movie, you don't get a real good glimpse at him. It's more of a, you know, uh, spiritual, you know, ghost or phantom type of character. But you do actually have the main uh, demon, evil, whatever, going around and using kind of a, um, I guess, predator. Predator is the first one that comes to mind. Kind of a predator, you know, heat-seeking lens. And when you see that lens, it's like, oh, there's the evil. And it's, it's going to do some evil things. And the kills... Which are, of course, by, you know... I don't think this is spoilers. I'm going to try not to say any spoilers. But I don't think it's a spoiler to say in a Children of the Corn sequel, some kids kill people. And when they're doing the killing, or it's uh, he who walks behind the rose, their little deity, whenever there's kill scenes in this thing, they are fantastic. I mean, better than you would expect for just a, a, a sequel to an okay horror film. I mean, some really good stuff, some practical gore. Uh, this was 92, so quite before CGI got so readily available to be able to just overuse and, uh, you know, kind of get negligent with, if you want to use that terminology, you know, just ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of CGI. This was way before that. So everything's practical. Uh, the blood is... Way over the top, there is a bloody nose scene in this that made your host even cringe a little bit. And uh, not, not in, the, in the way of like, oh, that effect's so fake. No, 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 I said, oh, that effect's so good. <laughs> I mean, Sam Raimi would nod his head in approval. Mmm, Raimi. Hell, still on the nothing but positive things that I have to say about this flick... There is a Native American character who is, I would say, especially for the fucking early 90s, played real straight and non-stereotypical for, like, movies of that time. You know, he's a little more fleshed out. He's a man of myth and science. And it, it maybe it doesn't seem like something huge, you know, like, hey, you know. Throw your fist up in equality. Maybe it's not this grand thing, but it just, it was enough to be like, hey, they could have had this character be the, the stereotypical mystic, but instead they, they fleshed him out a little bit. 
and I gotta give credence to something like that. Hell, Ryan Bowman uh, plays a character named Micah, who is our Isaac equivalent, and he does a pretty good job. Now, as memorable and as, I as iconic as the Isaac character from the first film, no, not quite as much, but the Micah character is fun. Um, Ryan Bowman's facial features kind of remind me of a mixture of Christian Slater and um, Justin Long. So like a Justin Long, Christian Slater mix, he definitely has uh, the looks, you know, for this kind of villainous character. Um, and uh, he, he goes over the top. He goes, you know, aggressive, cliche, scary preacher. Uh, but I do feel that Bowman puts a little bit more, like, Nick Cage levels of over-the-top, just, just at these moments that make me actually go, okay, all right, fucker, I do miss Isaac, but I'm in with the Micah character. Take us away, you are our lead villain, let's go. The last thing I'll say before I rate this puppy is that this tone works a lot better for me than the first one. The first one was very serious, very dour, and I don't mind that. You know, that can be fun if done right, but again, for me, that first one is just okay. This film totally embraces, hey, we're just some, you know, early 90s, uh, middle-of-the-road, uh, slasher-esque horror sequel. Let's just make this thing as goofy and gory and as over-the-top as possible. You know, let the effects kind of shine. You know, just drench everything in blood. And for me, that, that's just a much more entertaining experience. This does not overstay its welcome. At an hour and 34 minutes, you get in there, you see some horrifying images, nothing's too serious, you laugh a little bit, you have fun. This is what I would call a perfect popcorn horror movie. So, without further ado, four tiny top hats out of five. The captain certainly recommends this little sequel. Now, after I saw the sequel, I was kind of riding a high a bit. I'm like, I wonder if there's anything more to this franchise. You know, is this just a little gem hidden in the trash can, if you will? Or are there many gems in this uh, godforsaken garbage jungle we call movies? So, I watched Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, and... Oh, man. Did I enjoy this? Yes. With this plot, um, you have two young men, two, I think, half-brothers, or maybe, you know, brother and stepbrother, actually get out of Gatlin, uh, which is the town that the horrors have... Uh, more or less taken place up to this point. I think in the sequel, um, it was like the town next to it. But, you know, in this little rural part of the world, uh, they actually get out of Gatlin and they go to Chicago. You know, a little exploratory of why the urban part is in, you know, the title for Urban Harvest. Um, I absolutely love the idea of doing something different. That doesn't always work in horror franchises. Sometimes you take a pretty big risk and you fall off the cliff like, uh, you know, arguably Jason Takes Manhattan. Maybe to us Friday the 13th films, we still love that film. But uh, as a whole, as certainly box office numbers, yeah, that was a flop. Now, to my knowledge, I believe only the first Children of the Corn had a theatrical run. So I believe all the rest of these sequels are, you know, straight to VHS, straight to DVD, uh, later on straight to streaming, I imagine. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but I, I believe only the first one was uh, theatrical. 
Um, so this really has the uh, room to kind of go crazy and do whatever it wants and to take this, you know, little cult, you know, supernatural story and put it uh, in the middle of a large city. I thought that was really cool. So I was already really on board and we get introduced to our leads, the brothers, and certainly one of them right off the bat, I'm like, oh, and here we go with Isaac part three. <laughs> it's like, why don't you just bring back the actor? You know, I, why didn't you just do that? But who they got was a child actor named Daniel Cerny. And, you know, he did really well. Uh, he played the character Eli. And he was certainly my favorite by far of the Isaac substitute. Um, you know, he was a little younger than our uh, last Isaac Light. Um, and he totally brought an air of menace and, you know, a very obsessive, you know, um, uh, need for control to, for his character and uh, just an overall tone of, you know, uh, evil things come in small packages, I suppose. Now, the main plot is not exactly straightforward. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things happening in here. There's um, some uh, lore being changed around, which I don't know if I'm a huge fan of. Um, there's, you know, a little mystery. Uh, there's just these, there's a lot going on in this film. Um, I would say the biggest positives for us horror fans would have to be the gore. If you thought the last one was gory, this one amps that up even just a little bit more. But it starts to be so creative with its gore, so fantastical, that it reminds me of some of the later Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. So, I mean, if that's your bag, if you want to see some really cool practical effects... Have some moments of ooh and ah, etc. Then this film really hits home. There's uh, a great practical effect at the end. That's very Lovecraftian. I don't know if it'd be on par with something like The Thing. You know, that's your that's your gold standard of practical monster effects. But I would say it's like the you know B movie version of something like you'd get from the thing. And actually, I really enjoyed it, you know. Uh, you know let's call it low-budget Resident Evil a little bit towards the end there, and carnage just ensues, you know. And I, I, said, I don't think that's a spoiler to say people die in a horror film, but especially those last 10, 15 minutes, um, if you think it was already gory and crazy and, and pretty fun, those last 15, 20 amp it up even further. Uh, so I might enjoy this film maybe even just a little bit more than the last one. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, if it ain't obvious, I like this one and the last sequel. Um, I think both of them are far more uh, enjoyable films than that first one, Children of the Corn. Um, I mean, Christ, there's a sick. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scene where a very derelict man, a very, very homeless gentleman uh, that I deeply, deeply related to because of the unkeptness and the uh, glazed look in the eye. Uh, <laughs> he stumbles upon a cornfield, and of course this is in the city, so he's just like, oh, fucking jackpot. He can just eat this shit all day. And what ensues is just very... Uh, I don't know, let's say Arkham Asylum, the game, right? Uh, with the Poison Ivy stuff. It's very Poison Ivy in like the most uh, horrific way. And it comes back later with that same hobo character uh, as a little motif. And uh, I just really enjoyed that. You know, when you can get creative with your uh, horrific images, not just, oh, guy stabs someone. Oh, person slashes someone, when you can do kind of a body horror, kind of make it a little more personal, a little grotesque, um, I definitely give some extra points for that shit. I think the last note that I will 
mention uh, before rating this puppy uh, is this feels tried and true to me like all the perfect makings of a cult horror film. You know, give us your Rocky Horror Picture shows. Give us your Halloween 3, Seasons of the Witch. This this feels like this should be a cult horror film. I, I mean, I've never really heard this thing talked about, so I don't know if there is a giant following, but if there isn't, there should be. Maybe if there hasn't been, let's start it now. You know, I think it's a, a perfect topic to bring up in conversation. You, hey, fella, chief, come here, come down to my level here. Yeah, my arm's around, you deal with it. What I'm trying to tell to you is, uh, hey, <clears throat> you ever see that Children of the Corn sequel? Uh, you know, and they, they respond, they did sequels to that? And you go, yeah. Yeah, they did some sequels to that, pal. Uh, did you ever see that one? Huh? You, you'd know it, that one where they, they go to the city... Or it's Children of the Corn versus, you know, like the inner city. Did you ever see that one, pal? And, and your friend looks you square in the eye with uh, truth and conviction and says, No, no, I never saw that. And you say, Guess what, pal? Guess what, friend? You know what I'm going to do for you? I got the DVD right here. And they say, I don't have a DVD player. I stream everything. And you say, <laughs> You say, Boy, you're making this real difficult. It's just a fucking analogy. So watch the film, and they go, okay, I, I guess I can figure it out. That's, <laughs> that, that's your ideal scenario, and I hope that, <laughs> that you can not only watch this film, but if you do, and you enjoy it, tell someone else about it. Force the DVD on them. Let's get this to be the next, like, weird little niche cult horror flick that everyone hated, and then, of course, we mention it now, and they all goddamn choke on it. They love it. Hashtag Children of the Corn, Urban Harvest, the new big cult movie. Now, like I said, I think I like this film just a little bit better, just a tad bit better, than the last one, and that was that was four tiny top hats out of five. So you could even count this as four and a half. You know, cut one of those top hats in half, and you could kind of do that. But just for uh, safety sake, for accessibility, let's give this a four tiny top hats out of five. Children of the Corn, Urban Harvest, go watch it. And now, a word from our sponsors. Now, just when we were having fun, now we have to talk about Children of the Corn for The Gathering. Now, I should note first off and foremost, uh, Naomi Watts, young Naomi Watts, uh, basically holds this together. Um, you could obviously see why she would go on to uh, a lot better things later on. Um, and uh, I always like that. To be able to put on a older horror film, let's say 80s, 90s, and then you see some actor, actress just waiting to bloom. You know, your uh, Johnny Depp's in your Nightmare on Elm Street's, your uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and your Critters 3... <laughs> if I ever met DiCaprio, I'd want him to sign a poster of Critters 3. I'd just like to be that guy, really. You know, maybe he signs it. Maybe he tells me to go fuck myself. Either way, a memorable experience. <laughs> now, Naomi's not the only one, of course, in this film. We do have horror legend Karen Black. And, you know, normally when she pops up, there's just fun to be had. But she doesn't get to do much here. I think she plays her role well. She's uh, a mom who's maybe got uh, Alzheimer's or some type of dementia. You know, she's she's seen better days. And I think she plays the character fine. There's kind of a setup with her being agoraphobic, meaning she's afraid to leave her house. But But the payoff is so minuscule 
Like, if you blink, uh, tsh, you will miss it. Now, unlike the last two sequels, the gore in this, the practical effects, are definitely uh, pulled back to a noticeable degree. Um, not to say there isn't any killing, there isn't any kind of slasher-esque scenes, but they're just not as fun as the last two. Um, they just look very cheap, you know, and cheap can be fun. Cheap can be entertaining, but it also can just be fucking cheap. And that's what we have here. I can't... I can't really recall anything that stood out to really mention or something that really got me or made me go, ooh, you know, it was, it was basically run-of-the-mill stuff. I mean, the story is interesting. Um, I don't think it really works overall, but they do try to add more lore. They do, they do have a, you know, kind of flu or epidemic uh, plot which, you know, anyone who's been around the last couple of years, you know, might get a little ah out of just because of our modern times. But I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere, you know, like it, and the few places that other setups uh, do go for payoffs is not anything really great. This is the first uh, sequel to Children of the Corn to me. That feels like that classic Dimension Hellraiser uh, shtick, where they're like, "Oh, we need to we need to keep uh, the copyright, so we have to make another Hellraiser." Oh, what the fuck? Oh, here we we got a script about uh, a cop solving a mystery. You throw Pinhead in it, you know. This feels like one of those where there's probably an existing script, and they said, "Well, fuck, what properties do we have here?" Oh. Just throw some corn in it and, and some fucking kids. We'll call it Children of the, the, the Corn 4. Um, you know, thanks for everyone for, for gathering here today. Oh, that's it. Children of the Corn 4, the gathering. And they threw a couple bucks. They did get, you know, a star like Naomi, but this was before Naomi Watts was really a household name. So, you know... They didn't, maybe they didn't know what they had there. This was also the first, uh, out of any of the pre-existing uh, Children of the Corns, you know, even including that first one where I was just more lost and bored uh, than anything else. There's some really strange editing choices that just feel choppy, and like the editor was sitting there, you know, I was smoking a cigarette. You know, he, he got his 20 bucks for the day, and he's like, ugh, I gotta go microwave me some pizza. You know, let me just, uh, let me just throw this together. I want to get to that microwave pizza. Smokes his cigarette. Fuck. Fuck, I gotta, I gotta edit Children of the Corn. What is this, four or five? Who cares? I just, I'll, I'll, I'll think of something. Chop, chop, chop. Chop, chop, chop. You know, one minute. E e e e and reheated microwave pizza maybe that's the best way to describe this film my rascal pie rates uh this is reheated microwave pizza oh sure you don't want to cook anything you're too cheap to order out throw in that pizza in the microwave this is this is the the, the remnants this is the last little bit of yum you have in your fridge. Last little bit of creativity. Nuke it for a sec. Maybe it will taste a little similar. Not quite. You'd certainly prefer the fresh pizza out of the oven. Mmm, like a mama used to make. And that's what this film is. Click that button. <coughs> Ding! Reheated pizza. Three tiny top hats out of five. Now, it is too bad that we have to end it here, on a, certainly a lower note in the series. But, I <laughs> have a feeling that the notes can, and will, get lower. Now, 
I'm not saying that there isn't still a chance to find some gems along the way when we do a part two for uh, the Children of the Corn uh, horror series. But uh, so far, you know what? We got two. We got two. I, I really enjoyed the first sequel and uh, its uh, second installment there. I mean, you know, one, Children of the Corn, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. You get two, pretty damn fun. You get three, pretty damn fun. And then four, again, you get something that's more or less fine. You know, I, I might even like it a little less than that first Children of the Corn. You know, it's just okay. Um, you know, thank goodness Naomi Watts got her, you know, stardom, and she went on to uh, just so much better uh, artistic material. And, um, you know, as far as uh, that second one and that third one, I would recommend that anytime, anywhere, I think. Children of the Corn, just with that very, um, you know, fall kind of feel, I think it'd be perfect for the Halloween season. You know, throw the first one on just in the background, have your friends over, open up your keg, smoke your weed, whatever, and then, you know, get a little later and actually want to sit down and chill out, put on number two, put on three, you know, be that guy uh, or gal at the Halloween party that actually you know, sticks around to watch the horror movies. Sure, drink, talk, smoke, all of that. But watch the fucking horror movie. Number two, number three are solid recommendations. And if you have to put on the first one, or even uh, the fourth one, The Gathering, okay, that's fine. Just maybe save, like, two or three for the finale. You know what I mean? Mix them up, don't watch them in order. You know, watch the weaker ones first, then it gets better from there. It's a lot you could do here, but I am truly and sincerely rambling, and I'm going to try to cut it off here. Thank you, especially to those of you who stayed all the way through, and, and hopefully I didn't spoil anything for you, and you can just go and watch these films uh, yourself. I'm actually going to pick up a DVD pack here in the next day or two that has a whole bunch of the Children of the Corn uh, sequels, including the ones I just talked about, and then you know, I'll be able to do the uh, part two, and we'll see. We will dig, my rascal pirates. We will fucking dig. Here's our uh, pail. Here's our shovel. Let's dig in that sandbox, and we're going to find out. Do We got some genuine nugs of horror here, like the second and third installment of Children of the Corn, or are we just dicking around? playing in our little sandbox, only to realize it's full of kitty litter and shit. I'm your captain, Patrick Ferguson. Remember to stay tuned for the main show, Strange Brew Reviews, where I am forced to watch and review shitty movies, as well as the Clock Tower Quickies, <laughs> that are five minutes or less non-spoiler. And remember... Corn is only scary when Jonathan Davis has been drinking. Goodbye and good night.